this presentation, so I'm just going to get rolling into it. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about the state of front-end architecture uh, in the year 2015 and start talking about some of the trends and tools and workflows uh, at a very high level just to introduce a number of these concepts. Uh, my name is Aidan Foster. I'm a front-end architect and my company is Foster Interactive. Uh, we're a web development shop that works with actually with other web development shops a fair amount, um, small and medium enterprise, different kinds of businesses where we help implement websites that have uh, fairly, you know, uh, websites that need to be built that need to be maintained and taken care of um, uh, in the long run. So we need a sustainable, manageable website that works in all kinds of platforms. Uh, I'm the vice president of the Toronto Drupal User Group, which organizes the Toronto uh, monthly meetups and help, and help organize this conference. Uh, we're the website sponsor, so we put together the DrupalNorth.org website. Uh, and I also run uh, and founded a meetup for SAS, which is the CSS pre-processing language. Uh, so again, a meetup that meets up every month or two to talk about SAS. So <laughs> I've got a quote from Carl Sagan, you have to know the past to understand the present. I kind of love the 80s ridiculous turtleneck uh, image. Uh, and really that's important to understand that, that what we do with our front end architecture now is a direct result of sort of the history of what's been happening in web design. So we kind of start in the pre-mobile era, back when we used computers and the internet was attached to a cable that was attached to a piece of furniture. And that was our experience. Um, I used to remember people's phone numbers. I used to have to print or write down directions before we went to certain places. And that's sort of the history of, of where we started when mobile sort of kicked in. But now we move into 2007, and I call this the early mobile age, and that clearly began with the iPhone 1 when it came out, uh, 320 by 480 screen. Uh, the iPhone is significant not because it was the first web-enabled browser, but it was the first one that could deal with desktop-oriented uh, websites really well on a small screen. So this really began that era of, of the mobile web. Uh, in 2008, then Android came out in the G1 in North America, it was released as the HTC Dream. In 2010, the iPad 1 came out, followed quickly by the iPhone 4, which is significant because it's the first ultra-resolution screen uh, device that, that at least I was aware of. Followed by the Samsung Note 1, uh, which began this trend in phablets and like you know, when that came out, my buddy had a Samsung. I was like, that's a crazy, you know, that's a crazy device. Why do you want a phone like that? Turns out pretty much all phones are like that now. So it's really difficult to predict how these trends are going to go. And then we move into 2012. Windows 8 came out along with the Windows Microsoft Surface. Uh, and all these crazy laptops with touchscreen, different sizes all over the place. That was followed in the same year in 2012 by the Xbox getting a software update which gave it a web browser. Around the same time, all kinds of TVs and smart TVs and all that started becoming really popular. And then we move into 2013, Google Glass came out. Uh, one day after it came out, the term glass hole uh, was released <laughs> upon the internet. And so, and then we move into 2014, Android Wear, so you get, a fan, you know, you get your smart enabled watch which for some crazy reason has a web browser app you can install. So yes, you can use a one inch web browser screen on your wrist, but maybe just like the phablets, maybe that has some use I'm just not aware of yet. In a few years, I'll have a web browser on my watch. 2015, Google Glass is abandoned uh, by Google, but they promise something new will come out. So it's a form factor that at least I want to think about. Uh, and then Apple Watch came out, which doesn't have a web browser on it yet, but you need to hack it. So really what we're looking at here is that we now face in this landscape of all these devices a number of challenges that our pre-mobile ancestors did not face. Device formats is a challenge. We've got to deal with screen sizes, display densities, user interface inputs, and a wide range of, of HTML support on those devices. We need to worry about performance. So first of all, these signals are coming potentially over randomish, crappy Wi-Fi networks, or sorry, uh, 3G networks, that kind of thing. And then there's the second sort of big challenge that comes with, uh, with performance, which is figuring out the problem of how do we get a big high quality picture on a high quality device and a small optimized picture on a small screen device. This also introduces the problem of testing, right? So we need to figure out, you know, we need to decide how many devices we intend on supporting. And then we need to install all the browsers that those devices themselves support. 
And then we need to figure out how many screens we're going to worry about. So all the screen sizes. So we end up with this incredible complexity and diversity of the number of vices we need to address. Planning and design is really hard. So you know we got to figure out how to take all the content from our website and cram it into a little phone. Uh, and we need to think about new design processes that, uh, that have evolved in this case. And as a result of all of these other problems, we now have way more complex code. We need like way more lines of front-end code to render a website because it needs to deal with more cases and be more flexible. So let's take a look back at what the solutions were in the past. As soon as the iPhone came out, dedicated mobile websites came out, and they were called the iPhone version of your website. In 2008, when the Android was released, the first thing it did was it said it lied to the user agent, which is how it detected you had an iPhone and sent you to the to the iPhone version of the website. And so it lied about its user agent so that when you bought an Android, you would still get that, that iPhone version of the website. In 2010, the Retina version of the iPhone came out, and it also lied about its screen size because it's got this nice high-resolution display, but you wouldn't want this cr crappy little thin stripe of a website on your, uh, on your Retina iPhone. So it lied about its resolution. And then the iPad 1 came out, and we were doing all this signature detecting. And I don't know, initially when it came out, I'd load up websites on the iPhone, and it would load up the, uh, sorry, on my first iPad, it would load up the iPhone version of it. So it'd be this thin little website on your nice tall screen. So that's an example of user agent detection gone bad. That problem was fixed pretty quickly. Um, 2011, all these phablets come out, right? And they're just all lying about their screen sizes and resolutions. Some of them are pretending to be iPhones, some of them aren't. And so this is, this, to deal with this problem, this system, WRFL, is this database that is like a master list of every mobile device that's ever been released, times the number of browsers they could support, and all the rest of that. And they compiled this database, and then it outlines all the capabilities of every possible device in there. So it kind of reminds me, like, who else has a list of all the children in the world, who, what they're <laughs> capable of? So this is, it's basically like, it's like Santa Claus. And it's got this big long list of every device that exists, and some are naughty and some are nice. And so really it also doesn't help when all the devices kind of pretend to be other devices as well. So the use of dedicated mobile in 2008 actually was a pretty good solution. You know, there's three phone formats we need to worry about plus desktop. Performance, well on the mobile one we give it 320 pixel wide picture, so it loads pretty quick. Testing it, buy the four things and test it. Planning and design, well, okay, it's double, right? So you design the desktop and then you design the phone version. And then code com complexity, well, it's exactly double, right? You've got two websites to build and maintain. Not so much in 2015, right? We got all this stuff to, to build and there's no way you're building a TV, a phone, a phablet, a tablet, a small tablet, you know, and everything in between. So it's really just not practical anymore as an approach. So I'll call this the early mobile dark ages of dedicated mobile, which takes us out to 2011. And then in 2011, the miracle of the Boston Globe was released upon us. So this is the first big commercially viable responsive website that came out. It was mission critical to their business. It was high volume subscription based website. And it even came with its own guidebook on how to implement it. So Ethan Marcotte's responsive design. So this is really the beginning of a new change in how we approach front end development. Uh, and it really, um, really ushers in what I'm calling, I guess, the responsive mobile era. So following up into that, the year 2013 was declared the year of responsive design by Mashable. In 2014, it's an interesting uh, development. The AOTA, Ontarians with Disabilities Act, kicked in for websites for any company with 50, or any organization with 50 or more people in it. And you now need to comply with the WCGA two level A standards for accessibility uh, at the beginning of 2014. And it just happens to be that using uh, a mobile first responsive website approach, it's much, much more conducive for making a good accessible website than it is to fragment across your websites across a number of platforms. Um, later in 2014, Shopify reported that 50% of all their traffic was on mobile devices. And then in 2016, Google Mobile get in, right? Google changed their algorithm so that if you search Google on your mobile phone, it basically filters out any websites that don't work well on mobile phones. So by 2015, we have to support mobile. 
There's really two competing strategies, dedicated mobile and responsive. Dedicated mobile is no longer practical, so we are now clearly in the responsive era. So now we look at responsive design you know, when it first came out in the year 2012, and we're faced with all the same problems, but it really solves only one, right? It only solved the display format problem because we still have the issue, especially with like classic responsive design where we send a high resolution picture to all the different variations of the screen and it squishes and it flows and it fits, but it's still a performance issue because you don't want that high res image on your small screen. Testing is still a nightmare. We've got a million devices and how exactly we're gonna test them all, planning and design. It's even worse than the times two case because now we have to come up with like basically entire new methods of thinking about how we design stuff and the code is super complex and there's no simple shortcuts we can use to make that easier. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how some of these solutions have, have evolved that aren't responsive design and this is really what we're building in our, um, in our uh, uh, front end sort of development stack to improve this. Before I go into too much detail on that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about performance and so why performance is important. Uh, this is from Google's breaking the thousand millisecond time to glass mobile barrier. And so what this is, is uh, they've done an analysis of user race analysis and how people perceive websites based off of how quickly they load. So if you load a website and it takes 0.01 seconds to load, your perception is that it, it occurs instantly. If it takes one second to load, the people's experience is they are freely moving around the website. If it takes four seconds to load, we're now at the threshold where you press, you press a button, four seconds later, your mind will start to begin to wander. And at text, 10 seconds, we're basically unable to focus on the task. So if, you, if, you, if, you make, if your website, you click it and it takes 10 seconds for that next page to load, people tend to basically forget what they were looking for and you've got a very, very high chance of just closing it off, you know, check your email, go do something else because you're probably going to forget what you're doing or go and use a different website. So we need to make sure that our websites, while many people <laughs> would argue, you know, and Google's arguing you should be at one second for it to load time, we, uh, we, there's a general consensus that four seconds is a pretty critical threshold that we should all remain under. While the importance of how fast websites work uh, has become more obvious based off of things like Google's analysis. We look at, the, look at the data of what's happened. And so this is from when the Boston Globe came out till last year. And this is the average page load size for a website when they're loaded. And we can see that it's gone from roughly one megabyte to roughly two megabytes over this period of time. So while it's become obvious that it needs to be super, uh, it's super obvious that it needs to be a very fast website the size of it has doubled, and the speed of our internet has certainly not doubled in that period of time. So what was actually happening is, is websites are becoming slower, even though we know it's important for them to be quick. So what are some of the strategies that have evolved to do this? And the first I'm gonna talk about is the use of a performance budget. So this isn't code, this isn't, this isn't anything other than a workflow process, really. And it starts off with, at the beginning of a project, where you're gonna do some measurements. And you're going to compare, you should, you should do some load test times on your competitors' websites just to get a baseline and see where folks are at. Then your team collectively, that means designers, stakeholders, developers, business managers, everyone needs to get on board with this concept and pick a target. And you're saying, we're drawing a line in sand. If all your competitors take 10 seconds to load, you're laughing, right? Because if you get to four seconds, then people are going to leave their website and come over to yours because, they're, because the experience is so bad. So you pick a target and it's going to be four seconds or less. I actually tend to pick four seconds because it's pretty hard to get websites down to four seconds sometimes. So then we go through development and cycles of testing. And so as you build and iterate on prototypes of your website, you remember to test it and it's part of your release cycle and, and your release management to build and test, build and test. And if you increase, if your tests show you are greater than your target, you have to redesign something before you push that stuff into code. And so that could be redesigned as in, you know, a common thing is we've got a big masthead on the homepage. Marketing says, ah, oh, that's got to be a slideshow so that we can present four of our business sectors instead of one. And so you load those in. And if that all loads on the page load, you're finding a long, slow load time. You know, that's a, that's a debate of either maybe there's a code solution. So you load one graphic and then lazy load the, less, the rest secretly behind the scenes. Or maybe it's a design problem. We say, actually, no, we're not going to put in that feature. And then once they pass the test, it's time to deploy. 
couple other tools have come out to help with performance. So the automated testing tools, so webpagespeedtest.org is one of them. And so this is a tool that I would be using for that testing phase, where you can just put your site up on a server and it goes and it pings it from a number of different locations on different browsers, different platforms, and it creates an average of that. So you can see where you're at, you know, 2.25 seconds. Okay, cool, we're under our four second limit. Another very useful tool is the, the PageSpeed Insights from Google. And this is just like, so I just fired in Drupal North into there, and you know, there's, we've got a 64% score because there's all kinds of other optimizations that are possible. Um, it re reports sort of false, uh, false reports sometimes, but it's still a very good tool and a quick and easy way to make a checklist to make sure that you didn't accidentally do something that, that you can really just uh, improve very easily. Another of the developments that has been very helpful in the front-end world for improving performance relates to images. And so one of the main problems is we've got all these different screen sizes and they have different display densities. So what is, ever since sort of IE8 dropped off the board, it's been feasible to use scale, scalar vector graphics in your website. And so scalar vector graphics, basically, it's just a, it's a different format of file that's really good for icons and logos. It's not like, it's, uh, it's not good for like photographic looking things, but for, for more graphic designery kind of components. And what's good about them is they will scale to any resolution and render very clearly at all different sizes and shapes. So Drupal 8 has, um, has scalar vector graphic support sort of built into it. They kind of expect you to upload your logo in scalar vector graphic. Um, but the other thing that scalar vector graphic gives us that nothing else does that's really cool is one major optimization advantage is that you can control the color of the graphics that show up in your website with your CSS code. And so what that allows us to do is, you know, in the past, say we have a button with an icon and you hover over the button and the icon color changes. You used to have to upload two pictures, one of each color of that graphic. Now we can upload a single SVG and it can make these two derivative variants of it simply with CSS code. So that's a, that's a significant optimization and it's convenient too, right? Like say you change the color palette a little bit in your website halfway through it, uh, you're just controlling that with your CSS, which is awesome. The next thing that's really cool and definitely unique about SVGs is responsive artwork. So this is an example of a logo where if you've got like a large amount of space on your screen, it shows up this highly detailed version of the logo. And as our responsive website squishes in size, so say on the mobile version of that, different qualities of the artwork, different amounts of information uh, are presented. So when it's large, it's detailed. When it's small, it's a very simple, uh, a simple symbol and none of the word mark stuff appears, which is pretty neat. This is, in my opinion, better than um, an alternative approach, which is to convert all your symbols into icons because you can do multiple color, uh, multiple color artwork with SVG and you can't do that with icons and you simply do not have this, this option with typography to the best of my knowledge. Another major element, so again, the, the, the biggest performance problem has always been pictures. How do we get the big picture on the big screen and the small picture on the small screen? Uh, the Responsive Images Community Group was formed in 2012. It is a bunch of clever folks who are both on the vendor browser side of things, uh, you, p clever developers and, and, and sort of stakeholders who are trying to figure out how to make images work well on mobile websites. And they came up with this new HTML element called picture. And what the picture is, is it's a, it's a new tag and basically you load, you, you, you make like six derivative images, let's say hypothetically, of a single picture. You upload them to your server and then it, just by using this tag in its simplest format, just knows which image to load for your screen. So that's, that's amazing. Uh, it's supported in Chrome now. Sorry, and this format came out in 2012, uh, 2014. So it took them two years to sort out and debate this issue. And now browsers, so uh, Firefox and Chrome both support it. The other browsers, uh, it fails gracefully, so it turns back into a plain old regular image with a small JavaScript uh, shim. You can actually get it to work on pretty much all the modern browsers. So this is an awesome, uh, an awesome format. And it deals with a second problem that wasn't even really, uh, really addressed in, in, in the fr in simply by getting the small picture on the small screen. You can see this image of the dog here on the desktop, and he's in front of like the White House or something there, I'm not really sure, but, um, and then we see the dog on the small display, and it, let's just assume for, for, for the purpose of this uh, demo that 
the subject matter of this image we want to emphasize is the dog and not that he's in front of the White House. If you just scaled this image down to 320 pixels wide, that dog would be tiny and basically invisible to see. So we can do art direction where we crop different shapes and sizes of images to put different emphasis on that component so that we can art direct this image. So in the context of say this is a blog post about a dog or whatever, uh, you would see the dog up and close on the small phone, but on a desktop experience, you get a nice big, uh, you'd still understand the context of that uh, situation. What is also really cool is Drupal 8 comes with responsive image and picture support out of the box by default. So now this is relatively simple to do uh, right in, yeah, right, right out of the box, which is great because we do a lot of work to get this going right in Drupal 7. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to kind of Cody stuff a little bit just to talk about what's been necessary uh, to help us build our websites. Uh, we're building them with SAS, which is a CSS preprocessor. Uh, basically, CSS as a language was always written to be super easy to read. And because of that, it's missing many of the cool functions that I would expect from every other programming language in existence. And so SAS gives us uh, basic math functions and, and, and sort of things that we kind of depend on in other languages. And, you know, the complexity of the requirements of CSS dramatically increased over time, but the language itself did not really evolve all that much. But really the main thing that I just want to point out about SAS that allows us to do things better is we can break up our, like, crazy, gigantic chunks of code into small bite-sized pieces. And in SAS, that's called a partial. And so our coders can like work on, and multiple people can work on one project at once, and I can work on this thing, and, the, and someone else can work on that thing at the same time. And then basically, because all that gets compiled out into sort of machine-friendly styles, it's been very efficient for helping us uh, work collaboratively on large, more complex front-end developments. I'm going to change gears back into what's happening in design. And so early on in 2012, possibly even a little earlier, the concept of using style tiles as a design deliverable early in the project was pioneered by Samantha Warren. And so what this is, is you've got four, four example style tiles here. And this is not user interface design. This is simply a sketch to present a feeling and emotion. It's a tool to talk about color and style and, and these designery kind of components completely independently of user interface design. And so this idea of, of, of separating out user interface from the feeling uh, sort of evolved in, in this idea we kind of ran with it in the design circles as, um, as, as the process of figuring out how to design responsive websites evolved. So it became kind of clear that that, that, that component of how we design websites is we're no longer designing like a page anymore. It's not like a page in a book because there's all these different flexible flowy screen sizes. We're more like designing a system of design to talk about how the various components and brand elements and user interface components all work together as a greater whole. And then, then by, by thinking about it in this way, um, we, can, we can keep it more consistent across our devices. And so the best technology that existed before this is a brand style guide. So like brand books for big brands, it says how to use the logo, how to use fonts, how to do banners, those kinds of things. So it's, it's, we're now, the design has kind of shifted from being more, less like page design and more like building a brand guide. And so early on in, early on, uh, in responsive era as well, um, component-based designs kind of manifest themselves as these kitchen sink frameworks. So Twitter Bootstrap and Zurb Foundation both give you these awesome packages of things where you can download a million widgets and components and then use them in your website really easily. I'm not a huge fan of them because one consequence of that, especially early on, was you get these huge slow payloads because you're loading all this code for buttons that you actually never use in your website. And the second thing is they, they kind of tend to look a little like each other. Um, the performance issue has been mitigated to a degree since the early days because they, they switched these projects uh, so that they use SAS so that you can include only the pieces you, you need. But there's still that same principle of like you, you, you're making a ton of assumptions about how the design is going to be implemented in your website when you download one of these frameworks. So that kind of evolved into another, uh, another idea which is the idea of making a roll your own bootstrap. And this was kind of, uh, so basically for your website, you custom build out a custom version of it just for yourself. 
And that was pioneered by uh, what is now manifested as Pattern Lab by Brad Frost. And this is the concept of atomic design. And it's really an interesting, um, it's an interesting way of thinking about how the relationship of user interface elements should be working in design. So he talks about atoms, and those, that might be like a text input field. And then atoms built up, it, so say it's a text input field and a button. And then we've got molecules where we start taking atoms and put them together. So you could imagine uh, an input field next to a button with a magnifying glass icon on it is now kind of a search input. And then we take that search input and say put it next to uh, a navigation bar. And now we've got the header for our website. So that's an organism. And then you might have the header for your website and the footer for your website coming together. And that becomes a template of which those templates are manifested across your pages. So I don't use these, this, this, this pattern uh, specifically, but we do something analogous. And I think even if you're being introduced to sort of component-based design, it's very useful to take a look at Pattern Lab and see how they break things down because it's well thought out and interesting. And I guess, so from a coder's point of view, this is awesome, right? It sort of defines how we break up, uh, break up and divide all of our, our different design components. But designers, I found they have a really hard time with this. Because if you ask a designer like, okay, design the text field, and then design the button, and then put the two elements together after. Designers don't like designing little bits and putting them together. They want to sort of get a feel for it as a whole. So we kind of merge the two ideas, and this is what's part of our workflow. So when we get a comp, so this is a website we just launched a couple days ago, um, and, but we received a comp of this website early on. And so we basically identified the chunks of it that are the components. So we've got the main menu component, the mass head component, and the actions component. And we call it actions, it's just our internal naming convention because we're trying to get people to do something, right? Like click on this and go and buy stuff or maybe it prompts you to call or whatever. So those are the, those, those are the separate components that we, we've identified in this particular layout. There are actually more, but you know, whatever. And now let me spin back to our CSS, uh, so to the advantage that our SAS have. SAS allows us to break up our files into individual pieces. So what we have actually done is now taken our user interface component and the file, the, the actual code that controls how that thing appears is in one file and each, each component gets its own separate file. So what we're kind of doing is we're taking how we think about design components and how we structure our code and sort of using both analogies to, to mirror each other which allows coders and developers to kind of collaborate in a more effective way. Another side effect of using this kind of structure with these components that are in separate partials on their own is that it's very efficient for reusing a piece. So uh, a reusing an action in a different place of the website. So we've got this on the home page. Uh, we could use it somewhere else in a very efficient and simple way. So this idea, right? This is an evolution of how things are, how things are changing in our front end workflow experience. But we've got another advantage we can do. So we've got our SAS partials that that generate our, 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 our site's website. But we actually now use a separate program called Hologram. There's a presentation coming up uh, tomorrow on KSS, which is an alternative uh, way of generating style guides. So really, literally from the same files, we put some text comments in the top, and those text comments define what the HTML of the components uh, are, are, are defined as, and we generate two outputs from the same source files. One is our live website, the second is a full style guide website that's generated from the same code. It works in HTML. We, we can test it on our individual browsers, our individual components, uh, uh, you know, give it to our clients to approve what these pieces look like while we are building things. So we can debate about font rendering and that kind of stuff in a context that's real and relevant to the project rather than by debating about why the font doesn't look like the Photoshop comp after the fact. So this is an example from the, the Entercare website I was showing before. On the right here, here's the nav for our finished, our evolving style guide, right? As you work through the project, it started with like two or three things at the beginning. And as we worked through it, we started adding more and more components as more and more pieces of the website get mapped out. And it's responsive, right? So I just stretched the browser in this example. And you can see how an action component on the mobile phone, and maybe this is smallish tablet kind of size, the layout actually changes. So this is a really useful tool to show how variations work on real devices. And in addition to that, we, we, we started expanding out these components as well. So they have variations in design of these particular components. So we've got our vertical oriented action component. 
which looks pretty much the same at larger sizes regardless of the component, but there's a horizontal variant. When it gets small, the image goes to the left. If you see on the previous example, when it's small, the image stays stacked. So these are just variations of the component, and it's very efficient to do this because we have this manifest of all the pieces in our toolbox, our own custom bootstrap, so to speak, that we, can, we, we, we have automatically documented from our project. And sometimes we're coding and we work on this first and it, because it's easier to, to map out and plan this stuff out in the style guide itself. And sometimes it's easier to do the code in Drupal first and then we just sort of export the HTML and copy it over into our, into our style guide examples. So we take this idea yet another step further. So we take this output, the automated style guide that comes out of our website and we do what's called automated visual regression testing. So this is another tool that we add into the mix and what it does is it runs a test and the test already, what it, what it, what it will do is you tell it to look at, in our case we test our style guides, we tell it to look at that action component and what it does is it takes a couple screen grabs of the action component at a couple different browser widths and it saves them. So let's pretend I ran this test in the past and I run this test you know, net, right now. So it goes and it takes all these screen grabs of the, of the, new, uh, of the website when I run the test it compares them to the ones it has saved in its like backlog of, uh, of screenshots. And these two images are exactly the same, so it reports and it says, yes, this test has passed. If we were working on the action component and say we changed something, right? So we changed the font size of something. So let's say this was our pre-saved component and notice that the title has gone all caps there and we run the test again. It's gonna, it's gonna detect a difference. And it's going to, you can see, it actually shows you. So it shows you that this pink stuff is what's different between the two layouts of the website. And it identifies this. So this would be a test that fails. So as we work through our project, one of the things we can do is, like, as we build components out, we build automated CSS visual regression tests on them so that it will, before, <laughs> before we, we, we can easily compare to see, if I'm working on the action component and I'm changing a bunch of things and I press save, I'll run the tests and make sure that there's one fail on action component. But if some other component somewhere else, say I changed the title on this and it accidentally changed, you know, it's supposed to only change it on the home page and it changes it somewhere else, a different test will trigger and I'll see there's two failed tests or maybe even more. So this is a good sanity check to help reduce the testing requirements because it's so many devices, so many different things that we need to test on that anything we could do to automate some of that and it's really tricky to catch CSS regression errors sometimes because it could be like it never shows up until you rotate your phone, right? And so this kind of thing is, a, is an amazing tool for assisting with that. And speaking of testing, so this is the craziest setup I have used so far. There are tools called Browser Sync. There's another one called Ghost Lab, but Browser Sync is open source. So that's the one I like to use. And basically what it is, is you plug into your main development computer and then you get all these other devices on the Wi-Fi and you probably want to run them off of cables because you're going to drain the batteries of everything really quick. And you spin up the, the browser sync uh, server or the, run the Ghost Lab app. And as I'm saving and working on my code and browsing around on the sort of controller computer, all these devices follow along. So as I scroll up and down through them, they all scroll up and down. As I browse pages, they all browse around. So at least for manual testing, which still needs to be done, the automated stuff only helps catch some errors. You've got a, you know, a billion screens going and you can at least sort of see everything simultaneously. You see over here, I'm running Windows 8 in a VM you know, and a couple different browsers all at once. So this is a, a bit, this is the most of it. I tried to see how many you could connect before it would sort of it flood the network and this, this worked pretty well. Uh, realistically though, while I'm coding, I will have two, you know, like a phone and a tablet of different OS's and formats while I'm working. And literally as I save, it refreshes the main screen I'm looking at and it refreshes these two devices so that at least you can catch more problems literally while you're working and you get a better like idea of what you're actually coding uh, and it's delivered more in the platforms that it's actually gonna be received in. So one of the other things that is part of this larger puzzle that is important to take into consideration is how your team names their CSS. In the past, we just like do random stuff and name it like front page, you know, promo thing. And that is, makes it really tricky to maintain your projects over time because what we're trying to do is make these separate components. The separate components are both user interface components and their files. So there's a number of different competing 
uh, almost language, like, you know, patterns for how you should name your CSS. One is object-oriented CSS, one is SMACS, one is BEM. Um, it, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter which one you pick, so, so long as you get your entire team to sign up for one and sort of commit to it. And actually, there are now Drupal coding standards for how CSS should be designed. So given, uh, I would say, if you're not using any, the automatic default is to take a look at the Drupal coding standards, which are an interesting combination of both BEM and SMACS. Um, definitely, and so modules, even contrib modules, are now expected to generate their CSS to these standards. But Drupal's had coding standards for a long time, but this is a, a relatively new thing that we've got coding standards for CSS. And I add a tool into the mix to enforce my coding standards. So this tool is called SCSS Lint. And what it does is it's like a strict parent that makes sure that I format my CSS exactly according to the rules. One space too many? No, that's not good enough. Too many, you know, even the naming conventions, whether it matches the Ben standard or not, it can detect this. And what's great is that you can completely configure what the rules are, right? So if you take you know, it's more, it's more about like collaboration and team-oriented uh, uh, team development on the front end these days. And so if everyone on your team spaces the CSS components or the SAS components exactly the same, puts the selectors in exactly the same order, so our, our linter is that annoying that it's like, no, you got to put the display stuff first and then the color stuff and then the typography stuff. It's kind of like, it's kind of annoying and makes me cry a lot because I have to like do all this syntax stuff because it's technically valid, right? It will render and work no matter what. But if our entire team does it exactly the same way and it's consistent across the project and this standard might slowly evolve, but it's pretty, pretty consistent over time, it is so much faster to understand and pick up someone else's code or God forbid your own code from a year ago when you have a linter nagging at you constantly about what is right and not right about your code. And if you're in a rush for a hot fix, who cares? Push it up if the linter fails and go and fix it later. So it doesn't stop you from getting your work done. And so the output of this would look something like this. Uh, you know, you're supposed to put a zero on the front of 0.75 or, you know, there's one or two spaces that should be added into the mix. So I've got this crazy set of tools, right? It's like this huge selection of stuff that has been added into our front end development workflow in essence, to write CSS, which we used to write with a text editor by hand, but to assist all of those problems that have been coming up. So what do we do about it? We automate all the things. And so how do we do that? There are two competing major platforms. One is called Gulp.js, the other is called Grunt.js. These are systems you install on your local machine and they're task managers. And so what these can do is talk to all the other tools that I've been outlining. Um, they're both, uh, Grunt.js is a little bit older, so it's kind of got a mo more mature set of tools that have evolved for it. Gulp.js is newer, so it's actually more modern, performant, and customizable. So I, we, we used to use Grunt.js, and now we switched to Gulp.js, but they're both great tools. And so this task automation example is for when I'm coding. So I spin up, uh, I run this task watcher, and what happens is the computer sits there and waits until I press save on some file. And as soon as I press save, SAS fires up and compiles the CSS. Then it fires up and compiles the HTML and the CSS for the style guide. Then it takes all my connected browsers and refreshes them. And then it sends it over to the lint nagger and reports on all the syntax errors that I'm, that I'm working on. So basically, you know, press save does all these actions automatically. Every time I press save, if I've got a syntax error it is so much easier to catch them while you write them than it is to go and fix them all later. So it will nag, it will display, and I'm able to see all my stuff on different browsers as it goes through. So this is an example of a second sort of task that we've got set up generally, and it's a pre-deploy check, right? So I've been working on something, um, looks good to me on my local browser, and now I want to get ready to commit this code to a staging server for actual real QA. Uh, so I run the production build, compiles the CSS, does the style guide, lints the SAS, and now we add in a few extra tasks, right? We take all the images that are in the theme and we use a lossless image compressor. We take all the SVG graphics that are in the theme, we both, we copy them and compress them, and then do a second step which actually takes multiple different graphics, 
combines them together into one large file which has performance benefits and then outputs that to the site. Um, then after that, so we now have compiled CSS, but it does a second pass on it. And it looks through my CSS and it sees any tags that were in there that, um, that have, you need to have vendor prefixes for, for older browsers. And it goes ahead and it adds those in. And then it runs my CSS regression test to make sure that this change, you know, I, I look through the list of passes and fails. There should be, if I change one thing, there should be one fail and a whole bunch of passes. And so that's a double check before we go into, into live production. And so that, and, and I haven't got it working yet, but you can actually, I've seen a lot of people do, well, not a lot. Um, I've seen that it's possible to do, you can do an automated performance test on this build as well. So that thing can then, as a next step, go and query Google and run it through the, the, the optimizer or, or other tools similar to that. And you can make sure your load time is before under four seconds so you don't actually push up bloated code. Once all these things pass, then I'm ready to push that commit up to the QA server. So admittedly, it's not easy to set up all of these tools. Uh, there are a lot of pieces of the puzzle that come into place here, but it has some very, very significant benefits. Uh, your team's velocity will increase. You will have fewer bugs make it into your QA server, so that's fewer bugs to fix and fewer bugs to find. It's, all, it's difficult to push up code that isn't auto optimized because you, you, you're automating the compression of images and those kinds of things, so that you, you don't accidentally upload an image that should be compressed more. And what's, I think, the most valuable is that once you get these somewhat complicated dev stacks set up, you can recycle them relatively easily between your projects. And so, you know, once you pay your upfront cost of figuring this thing out, it's not too bad to transfer it to newer and newer projects. So I'll leave you with one word of advice. Take it in baby steps. Uh, yes, I've started my daughter early on, on this stuff. Um, whatever you're doing now, just add one thing into the mix. So if you're not using SAS, that's definitely the first thing you should add into the mix. If you're not doing living style guides, I'd say that that's probably the second thing to add into the mix. But just, you know, take it slow, add one item into your, into your process. Once you become comfortable with it, now it's time to add in a second item. And slowly over time, you'll end up building a more and more complicated stack and more and more stuff will get automated and you can you know, spend more time thinking about what you want to do in code, what you want to do in design, and less things and less of the mundane tasks that, that, that we, don't really, we don't want to focus on. I don't want to worry about compressing images anymore. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, let me know. <laughs>